Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate that, and thank you for the kind introduction. Certainly appreciate that as well. As I like to say, when you are at a conference and there are multiple tracks, just like the airlines say, you have a choice of airlines, and we thank you for flying. Well, you have a choice of presentations, and I thank you for coming here today. I got involved in, uh, in basketball research, if you'd like to call it that, and, and Mark Madness and bracketology around uh, six or seven years ago when I was watching the tournament. And I had one of those aha moments saying, something interesting is going on here. There's so much data, there's so much information. Can we weed out insights that other people cannot see with the naked eye using analytics and advanced techniques? And we've actually published a number of papers in academic journals on this. We've created a website. And this year, we actually had a, a lot of fun because Bleacher Report, how many people have heard of Bleacher Report? They are the third largest sports website in the United States, contacted me and said, hi, we'd like to send the crew out and film you and ask you some questions, and we're going to put it into some stories after Selection Sunday. And they did, so I'm in four little clips. And it, it looks kind of cool because it seems like I'm talking to the person who's who's asking me questions, but he's, I'm really, I've never met the guy. But that's the way things are in the magic of television. How many of you are basketball fans? That's what I kind of figured, you get a lot of basketball fans. How many of you have, are on track to win the one billion dollar <laughs> Quicken Loan Warren Buffett competition award? How many, how many of you had your bracket busted the first day? Probably most of us have, that's pretty much how it works. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a glimpse into some of our research. And I actually had my students running some numbers last night because I wanted to give up to the minute information. Now, does that mean that when you look at what we've done, you're going to be able to put together a perfect bracket? No. In fact, if you go to our website, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, we have a little section which is tips on putting together your brackets. And most of those tips don't necessarily help you get a perfect bracket but they will certainly help you avoid a disastrous bracket because it's very easy to create a terrible bracket and we don't even realize we're creating it. But the way that the numbers come out from the tournament, one could actually glean important insights to help you avoid a bad bracket. So with that, let us kind of jump into this. For those of you who are neophytes or non-fans, and it sounds like there aren't very many of you here, uh, the NCAA men's basketball tournament has become a national event. It starts in March, hence it's called March Madness. And you get, in fact, it used to be, uh, at one point, it started with eight teams back in 1939 before any of us were born, so that's long ago. And it kind of grew very gradually until it became kind of the modern era of 1985, which is 30 tournaments ago. 64 teams, the nice bracket structure that we see. You have to win six games to win the national championship. Then a few years ago, they started to tinker with it, and they added in the play-in games, and now we have the first four. And we, for the most part, ignore them, because once those are done, we are then at the 64 structure. And that's what we're really looking for. Now, this is a big-time event. Billions of dollars is gambled on the event, and I know none of you are involved in any of that. <laughs> and, you know, these office pools are technically illegal, so I do not condone them, nor do I participate in any of them. But ultimately, everybody's trying to get that perfect bracket, the set of teams that are, that are going to reach the national finals, the so-called Final Four. And in fact, we have the Final Four right now. I assume you all know who they are, but we have our number one, number one, which is Florida. Then we have Wisconsin from the Big Ten. We could have had three Big Ten teams. And being at a Big Ten school, I was kind of hoping that. And then we have Connecticut, number seven. And then we have Kentucky the so-called dark horse team, but they really aren't an eight seed quality. They're much better than that. So many models have been proposed to help people forecast the game winners. They look at you know, each team's record during the year and how their pace of game, and you can go to websites that give you a tremendous amount of information. Ken Pomeroy has wonderful information to help you do that. The Sagarin ratings also do that. Tremendous amount of information that is available based on data to help people assess when team A plays team B, who is going to win, or at least give a likelihood of who's going to win. Now, you can even just go to Las Vegas and look at the odds, and that gives you some reasonable sense of who's going to win. But, you know, is this really useful to the general public? You know, how do we use this information? What we'd really like to do is look at very simple alternatives. 
but hopefully alternatives that are data-driven and informative. And that's our purpose. So the tournament structure, as we already know, there are 68 teams, 37 of which are at-large participants, and those are teams that do not get an automatic bid, but will get a bid based on their, their, uh, their record through the year, their resume of activities to suggest that they're a strong enough team. And then you have the 31 conference champions, which include the power conferences like the Big Ten, the Big 12, which really doesn't have 12 teams anymore, or the Pac-10, which doesn't really have 10 teams anymore. They should avoid numbers in all of these <laughs> conference names. You know, eventually we're going to have like, like the Midwest 63 or something like that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So as a result, these are all the teams that are then put into four regions of 16 teams each, eliminating the first four. Well, we're going to not even talk about those. And there are teams which have a nice low seed, the best seed, which is number one in each region. There's the worst team, the 16, not a very good team in general. And there's a lot of issues that go into placing the teams. You know, they use things like the RPI, the BPI, and a variety of other ranking strengths of schedule, which help people determine where they're going to be. There's a selection committee that's put together to do all this. Now, it's a single elimination uh, tournament, which by definition means that the best team does not always win. Because a very, very good, the truly best team could have an off day, and a pretty good or average team could have a phenomenal day. In fact, one of the things that has made this happen more frequently is the three-point shot. If you have a team that goes out there and they're small, they're not very tall, they're slow, but they just happen to get into a groove and can hit 60% of their three-pointers, they can upset the power teams. And it does happen. And all you need is one bad day, and this occurs. Of course, we saw this happen this year when Duke, a number, any, any Dukies here? A number three seed was beaten by a number 14 seed Mercer, which quite frankly, we have that kind of upset every year. We don't know who it's gonna be, but it does happen quite frequently. So all these issues go into putting together the tournament in the bracket, and with a single elimination structure, anything can happen. So this is what a region will look like. We have team one playing team 16, the seeds, eight versus nine, five versus 12. And if we just went through the bracket as we see it here, we see that I've always put the top seeds winning each of them, and we kind of go through, and eventually you get the winner of the region, and that becomes the participants in the final four, which is what we have now, the four teams that I just mentioned. Now, when you're in the final four, then you have these regional winners paired up, and usually you have the best of the regional winners against the worst of the regional winners, or whoever was in that region and then they play each other to go to the national final game and ultimately we then have the tournament champion. Pretty simple, isn't it? Now, a simple question to ask yourself is, is it best to pick the better seed? Seems like a good strategy. There's a reason why number seven was selected to be a number seven seed and why a 10 was selected to be a number 10 seed. Seems to make sense that the seven should beat the tens quite consistently. But the fact of the matter is, although this is very attractive and very simple, it will not necessarily produce very good results. Because there's a certain amount of uncertainty. And this uncertainty translates into what we call upsets. And that's why on the Thursday and Friday after Selection Sunday, the first two days of the tournament, more people take off from work than any other time of year except for certain holidays. Because they want to be at home or in a, in a bar watching the games. Or they're at their computer acting like they're working, but really <laughs> they have it on cbssports.com and they're watching some team, which is seeded 15, playing number two, one of the powerhouse teams, hoping to see an upset. And they'll even have a little tracker on top of their computer. Very simple. So this goes on all the time. So if you look statistically at what's been going on, and this does not include this year, this is everything from 1985 to, to 2013, as the tournament progresses, the seed differences tend to be smaller. For example, in round five with the Elite Eight, 71% of the teams have been seeded number three, number two, or number one. If you go down to the national semifinals, which is basically when we reach the final four, 74% of them are. Then you get to the national finals, 83%, and then 90% of the winners have been seeded either one, two, or three. 
Well, that does suggest that the selection committee knew what they were talking about because the teams that are seeded better are producing more national championships and more winners. So as a result of that, this gives you a little bit of insight that there is some value to seeds. And this ultimately led us to start asking some research questions about seeds. So one of the things that we did is, and this was the first question, and we published this in 2009, we said, you know, these top 12 teams, seeded one, two, or three in the four regions, do they really differ? Is there a statistical difference between them? And the interesting thing is, this is what we found. In the first round, it's true. Seed ones are better than seed twos and that are better than seed threes in their performance. Same thing in the second round. Same thing in the sweet 16, the third round. But once you get to the elite eight, their difference starts to evaporate statistically. Which means that the reason why ones are winning more often than two than winner winning more often than three in terms of national championships is not because they're performing better in the final four, it's because seed ones are getting there more often. They're not being eliminated as often. That's all it is. But if the twos and threes can survive, their difference in performance between ones with ones is not that significant. So this is what we published. So we've continued to look at issues of this sort because we really believe that seeds are everything. They provide so much information because a lot of thought went into, in fact, choosing a seed for a team that we must be able to glean insights using advanced analytics. So here's what we did. We've created a number of models, but we took a, what we call an exponential model. I'm gonna talk about a few other models, but the exponential model is basically a simple model to see how far a team will progress against another team that it's matched up with. Now, what we then do is we're gonna generate random brackets based on this model, as well as some other models, as well as some straw man models and give you an idea of how well they can perform in the tournament. Our source of data is just basically everything that's available from the NCAA and the historical tournament results. <coughs> so if we look at the last 29 years, once again, we're not including this year, we have 63 games, forgetting about the first four, as well as the, uh, the play-in games. We have 1,827 total games of data. A lot of information. That information is very useful. So what we do is then, when subsets are taken on seeds and rounds, the sample sizes, though, do drop dramatically, which means that in the first round, we got a lot of data. In the second round, depending on the pairings, we'll have less and less data. And for example, in this year, we happen to have a seven seed reaching the final four. Interestingly enough, there has never been a seven seed in the final four before. It is new data. And as a result, that will be incorporated into our next year's analysis. So we're gonna make a random sample of these brackets. And we'll assume that the historical data is representative of, in fact, what we're going to see in the future. And that each seed has a constant probability of winning against any other seed in a specific round based on this historical data. So what's the math behind the data? What can we say about that? Like I told you, this exponential model is based simply on an exponential distribution. An exponential distribution has a cumulative distribution function of this particular form where it has a certain rate function lambda. One of its applications, of course, is it defines the inter-arrival times in a Poisson process. And this was where this idea came out. If we pit two teams against each other and we say one of them will arrive at a certain time based on an exponential distribution, and the other one will arrive at another time based on an exponential distribution. The one which arrives first will be the winner of the game. And the difference between them will be the seeds, and the seeds will be indicative of the rate. In general, if you have a good seed, you'll have a very quick rate, and it will happen fast. If you have a poor seed, it will happen slowly, and it will take a while, which means that the better seed should win more often than the worse seed, but because of the wonders of randomness, it doesn't always happen. That's how we incorporate the randomness into each game. So if we look at how this works, we have what we actually have in each round is what we call sets of seeds. Because in the first round, a one will play a 16. A one can't play a, an 11 in the first round. 
Now in the second round, a one, if they win, can play an eight or a nine, depending on who won between them. It can't play a 10. So that creates subsets of seeds based on the rounds. So in the second round, one and 16 will pair, two and 15 will pair, and so forth. Then we go down to the pairings in fours or quads. Then we go into sets of seeds where there are two sets of them. And then finally, when we're getting to the elite eight, anybody could potentially be playing each other at some point, or anybody could reach that point. So what we need to do is we need to determine which seed arrives first within each set. A very simple concept. So when you compare exponentials, and you want to know what's the probability that one exponential is less than another, all we have to do is simply use their rates. And by doing that, we're able to come up with a very simple expression for the probability that one team will beat another. If we want to look at groups in later rounds, we simply have to look at the smallest one. So we want to say, what's the probability that the one seed will, in fact, reach the third round? We just have to go through all the possible exponentials and see what the probability that the one seed's exponential will arrive first. And there are very simple closed form repre representations for that. So given this fact, if we happen to have, for example, seed number three and seed number 14, so seed number three will represent that by an exponential with parameter lambda three, and we'll have seed number 14 being an exponential with, with rate lambda 14. Since lambda three is gonna be larger than lambda 14, then x three is more likely to be smaller than x 14. So seed three is more likely to advance than seed number 14 when they play each other in the first round. Kind of very simple concept. So given this simple fact, if we then take the data that's available, we can build an entire matrix of all of the seeds and the rate at which they advance. This is all the data that's available. And by using that information, we're able to then have the teams compete against each other round by round and see who will advance and ultimately generate brackets, all based on the data that is here. And of course, these rate values are defined by maximum likelihood estimates, the simple averages. So let's look at the final four, because everybody's interested in the final four. It's where we are right now. We can use this model to actually compute probabilities of certain events that occur. To give you an idea, suppose you want to ask, what's the probability that there are no number one seeds in the final four? We can compute that using this model. And when we do that, the probability turns out to be around 0.121, uh, which is around 1.8. We expect it to occur 3.5 times. The actual number of times that it's occurred has been twice. And its expected frequency should be once every eight years, approximately. Having one number one seed in the final four, which in turns out is what we have this year, its probability is 0.337. We expect it to occur over the last 29 years, 9.8 times and we've actually seen it occur 12 times. Similarly, with two number one, slightly higher probability, similar expected occurrence, and similar or actual number of occurrences. Now, with three number one seeds, the probability drops quite a bit. As a result, the expected number of occurrences is smaller, and the actual is very small, also number three. And then four number one seeds, because we can't imagine number ones ever losing, its probability is minuscule. As you can see, it's much more likely to have zero number ones in the final four than it is to have four, by an order of around uh, four, four to five. We expected it to occur 0.8 times. It's actually only occurred once, which was just a few years ago. So given that fact, we can use this model to compute information like that, which helps you say, if I'm going to build a final four, how many number ones do I want to put in? Well, if you want to be data-driven, put in one or two, which is what we see this year, because those numbers have occurred 23 out of 29 times previous to this year, and the probability supports that. What about final four seed combinations? We can actually do that as well. So if we look at the seed combination 1, 1, 2, 3, its probability is 0 0.0508. It's actually occurred three times. If we look at 1112, it's only occurred once, and it has a slightly higher probability based on this model. 
If we look at 1122, it's occurred once, it has a slightly lower probability, 0 0.0455. And as we go down the list, what I've done is I've gone all the way down to 2011. I chose 2011 because it had, in fact, a very rare combination of 3, of 4, and 8, and 11. Its probability is 0 0.0003. It should occur approximately once every 35 hundred tournaments, a very rare event, but it does occur. In fact, most of the time, a good measure of what you should put into your final four is to choose the expected frequency so it's at 100 or less. If it's 100 or less, it does occur with great frequency. Most of the numbers turn out to be less than 100. There's only a handful which in fact are larger than 100. But some of them do occur because the laws of probability dictate that. Now, what about other final four seed combination odds? What about the probability that one or more 11s, 12s, 13, 14, 15s, or 16s reach the final four? In other words, what's the chance of having a double digit team, 11 or worse, in the final four? It turns out it's quite high, it's 0.11. Turns out 10 to 16 is, well, we're doing a little bit of rounding here, so it's actually slightly uh, higher. With nine or more, it's 0.15. In fact, we've seen 11s occur a few times. This year, we happen to have an eight, so we don't quite make the nine. But you can see that having a team which is seated nine or worse in the final four is a reasonably likely event. It does occur with reasonable frequency, and choosing it occasionally is worthwhile. What about having no teams, one, two, three, or four? very, very unlikely, should occur approximately once every 2,600 tournaments. And what about no teams one, two, or three? We have it to be approximately once every couple hundred years. What about no teams one or two? That one doesn't occur very frequently. And in fact, it hasn't occurred very frequently. So as a result, the model provides insights which can then be matched to what we've observed during the tournaments. Now the old perfect bracket. So the people at uh, Leach Report said, well, is it going to happen? And of course, the answer is no. The odds of a perfect bracket are in the orders of one, several quintillion to one against it happening. But even if you're intelligent and say, well, the ones and the 16s, we know the ones are going to win, and we eliminate the sure things, I, I estimated the probabilities to still be in the order of over a trillion to one against. So the expected cost to Warren Buffett and Quicket Loans was under a penny. <laughs> Needless to say, they haven't had a payoff. So that's not been a problem. Because you have to correct, in fact, they included the, the four playing games, the, the first four, so it made it even tougher. So this is really a very, very difficult challenge. It brought a lot of nice press and discussion in the media, but the reality is nobody was going to come even close to it. And the thing is, if you want a single bracket, it's even harder. Now, what if you're given the opportunity to have 10 brackets, 100 brackets, 1,000 brackets, a million brackets, 10 million brackets, 100 million brackets? Could you, if you were intelligent, actually come up with that perfect bracket? And that's when we started to think, well, now it gets a little more interesting. So we, we thought of the idea which we call bracket indexing. What is bracket indexing? Bracket indexing is analogous to index fund investing. How many people own an index fund in their portfolio? Most of us do. And why do we own an index fund? There's a number of reasons. One is it covers a broad market. It has a low cost structure. And anything that you're paying a professional is not included. It simply blindly follows either you know, the standard and poor 500 or some other index. It's very simple. In general, what it does is it bundles together a lot of information and uses that information to put together a consistent winner in your investments. Well, our thought was, can we do the same thing with brackets? Indexing of brackets. So we think of a single bracket as analogous to one security. So you can put all your eggs in one basket and invest in one security, and that's fine if you believe it's going to go up. 
Now, to generate many brackets, you can then ultimately create an index based on the underlying model. And remember, what we're dealing with is a different objective of function. In an index fund, the objective function is basically the average. We're not interested in the average. We're really interested in the maximum. We want the best bracket in our pool. So we have a slightly different objective function. That's very important and it makes this plausible. So here's what we did. We wanted to compare five prediction models in this indexing framework. We used our exponential model. We also took a random model, which is we, every game was 50-50, flipped a coin. The other strategy was that we always pick the favorite. Basically, in the first <laughs> round, we pick ones to eight. In the second rounds, we pick one to four. In the third round, we pick one to two. In the fourth round, we pick the one. And then we assume at that point beyond, we'll always pick the winners. We're giving the model the benefit of the doubt. We're not even randomizing that, making it purely deterministic. Then we came up with two other models. One we call a linear probability model. And what we basically do is we create the probability of a seed winning linearly based on their seeds. So when a one plays a 16, then the probability of the one winning is 16 divided by 17, and the probability of the 16 winning is one over, uh, one over 16 over 17, and then the probability of the 16 winning is one over 17. Same thing with the two versus 15 and so forth. The quadratic probability does exactly what I said, but now you square them. So the probability of a one beating a 16 would be 256 over 257. Very simple models, once again, driven by the seeds. Now the other thing I'm gonna tell you is that we're gonna generate a million brackets. And we're gonna generate them without looking at the teams. Absolute heresy. We can put sportscasters out of work. Because if we can pick a good bracket in this mess, wouldn't that be interesting? We don't care what the teams are. We will basically generate four regions and then assign one of them to the south and one of them to the east and one of them to the west and one of them to the midwest randomly. We ignore the teams completely. We do not know who the teams are. In fact, one of the advice that we give on our website is if you're going to put together a bracket, decide how you want your seeds to advance, and then once the teams are announced, fill in the east bracket, the west bracket, the midwest bracket, and the south bracket after the teams are announced. It's complete heresy. Why would anybody in their right mind not use team information? Well, I'm gonna tell you why. So we're gonna give you a couple of measures. One is the average and then the best bracket. And there's a scoring system that's used and we're gonna use the ESPN scoring system. And we'll also look at the number of correct predictions, how many games we actually got correct. So the scoring system from ESPN is very simple. They call round two basically the round of 64. They play the play in, they call the first four round one. I don't like it though, it's the way it is. And you get 10 points for each of those games. There's 32 games, so you have a total of 30, 820 points up for grabs. In the next round, you have 16 games. Each game winner is worth 20 points, so there's 320 points up for grabs. And you see the pattern. As you advance, if you get the winner, lo and behold, you're getting more points for that winner. The real problem is, suppose you had chosen Duke to be your national champion this year. Oh, how many people chose Duke to be their national champion? We have one person, and, and you admitted it. I appreciate that. It's my daughter. Oh, no, that's fine. You have your bracket with you. So you would have lost the 10 here, but then you would have lost the 20, and the 40 for Duke, and the 80, and the 160. I mean, your bracket is dead before it arrives. If, you get, if they lose the first round, who your national champion is going to be. So this is a very, very punitive scoring system. It is harsh. I didn't invent it. I'm just using it. So, so here's what we did. We went back and we generated a million brackets for a few years based on our models and all these models that I put up here. So back in 2009, let's take a look at what we came up with. 2009 was an interesting year. For one thing, it had the 1, 1, 2, 3, which is one of the most likely combinations. So it would be considered an easy year in our books. Remember, the maximum score is 320 times 6, which is 1920. The national champion turned out to be UNC. 
And all the ones, twos, and threes made it to the sweet 16. So when you're picking a lot of the favorites, you should have a high scoring bracket. So here's what we did. When you just picked the favorite, you were able to get 46 of the 63 games correct. It was a relatively easy year. The score that that resulted in was 1380 out of 1920. If you purely flipped a coin, you ended up with the best bracket being 1340. The average bracket was a minuscule 321. You, your best bracket had 44 correct games out of 63, purely by randomization. And then the average bracket had 21 out of these levels. Our exponential model produced 1830 with an average of 967. Its best bracket picked 57 out of the 63 games correctly, and the average was 39. But remember those simple models I proposed, the linear and the probability based on the seeds? Remember, we don't know the teams. We're just generating these and filling the teams in later. We don't care. We're not looking at you know, who the point guard was at UNC or, or whose Kansas center was that year and what the matchup. We don't care. We don't care at all. It's irrelevant. These models still did pretty well. 1660, 1680. Interestingly enough, the quadratic probability, which puts more weights on the seed. So in a year which is predictable, the quadratic probability model should do a little better. It had a nice consistent average of 1108, and still was able to get 54 of the 63 right with an average of 40, even better than the exponential. Let's go to 2010, <laughs> the, the Butler year, the 1255. The national champion was Duke, so there, you got your national champion. Wrong year. Wrong year. And what each of 9, 10, 11, and 12 reached the Sweet 16, there's a lot of points there that are being lost. So what this is, is it means it's a slightly tougher year. And that's reflected, for example, in the exponential, our best one producing 1710, where we had 53 of the 63 correct. Randomization produced 1470 and 44 as its best, which wasn't bad. The pick favorite, a little worse than the previous year, 1137 correct. The linear probability, and that once again, when you have predictability, somewhere between the linear and the quadratic should produce good results, and they are fairly close to each other, but the quadratic on average does seem to produce a little better because a lot of the games, the better seed is winning, and it's rewarding you for that. Let's go to 2011. <sighs> This was a deathly year. You had UConn, Kentucky, Butler, and VCU. Butler and VCU. Anybody from Butler or VCU here? Two, two Cinderella's in the final four. I mean, that's what you call death to a bracket. The national champion was UConn. No number ones or number two were in the final four. First time it ever happened. Last time it ever happened. It's the rarest Final Four dating back to 1985. It should not have occurred. But it did, because it does occur. Things happen. We were able to generate a minuscule score of 1530 as our best one. Still, we got 49 into 63 correct in our best one. But you can see how low the averages were, because this was a tough year. Every year is a little different. Randomization, because there were so many upsets, actually produced a relatively good result, being <laughs> the quadratic's best. And the reason is the quadratic puts a tremendous amount of weight on the favorites. And the favorites didn't do well this year. Picking the favorite was not a good year. You got a few of them early on, but boy, you only got 38 out of 63. 25 favorites lost. Was not good. And the linear probability was just slightly worse than the exponential. 2012. Final four had Kentucky, Ohio State, Kansas, and Louisville. One, two, two, four. A very, very likely combination. Kentucky turned out to be the national champion. Notice how many ones are winning. They do win quite consistently. And as a result, the scores were quite high. In fact, the linear, the quadratic, and all in the exponential were all above 1,700. Good score. And the actual numbers in the best were in the 52-53 range. Picking the favorite did reasonable, 1,200, with 41 of the 63 correct. And then the randomization, the best one was 1430, which was not bad at all. Remember, just flipping a coin. 
pretty good. Let's go to 2013. Final four was Louisville, Michigan, Syracuse, and we had one of our Cinderella's, Wichita State, and number nine. National champion was Louisville. For the first time, we had a seed number 15 enter the Sweet 16. Never happened before. They'd always won, you know, one game every now and then, but never two games. And who did they beat in the first round? Duke. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's something that's interesting. The winner of the ESPN Challenge, and that's several million brackets, their score was 1660. We happen to have that data. So our exponential model was 1640. Now let me tell you, and I'll tell you when I talk about 2014, this tail, it's not like you got a whole bunch of people at 1660. You'll have one or two there, and then you'll have another one there. But boy, by the time you get down to the median, it's usually around 600, 550. The, this, the slope around the median is it's very steep, and then you don't have a lot of people with really, really good scores. So to get to the 90th percentile, is you don't have to have a great score, as we've discovered. As you can see here, just doing randomly picking the, the seeds in each game, the best one did produce 1570, was not bad. Picking the favorites was 1160, the linear probability produced 1690 as its best one, and the quadratic probability is 1640. Now, as a basis of comparison, the ESPN challenge generates millions and millions of brackets people looking at the teams, people using strategies, some of which make no sense, some of which make a lot of sense. And all we're doing is randomly generating numbers, putting them in brackets, and then randomly throwing teams in. We're not doing it very intelligently, yet we can match or exceed what people have done. Let me tell you about 2014, so far. Our final four is Florida, Wisconsin, Yukon, and Kentucky. A 1, a 2, a 7, and an 8. Needless to say, this has never occurred. Not only has it never occurred, we've never seen a 7 in the Final Four. So this turned out to be the fifth rarest Final Four over the past 30 years, based on our probabilities. And the maximum score that you could have gotten through the Elite Eight is 1280. <coughs> now this is a tough year. So far, the leader has a score of 1120. And they picked 49, one of them, there's two of them. One had 49 correct games, one had 51 out of the 60 games. Pretty good. And the median is around 600 to 610, based on the data that we can glean from the table. Now, since a seven has never reached the final four before, our exponential model cannot pick it and is heavily penalized. And we did not expect it to do well because of that. It's just the nature of the data. But when the one nice thing about this is that in research discussions I had with my graduate students last night and this morning, we have figured out a way around it. So that will be our next paper. And, uh, and we're gonna rerun the results to see if we can actually produce better results. We don't know the national champion yet. We won't know that until a week from today. So here's what we generated. Our exponential model, the best, because of we couldn't get the seven in, basically really hurt us quite badly. The random was not bad. This is a very, very unpredictable year, so it produced a pretty good result. The pick favorite, 680, so-so. The linear probability produced the best results. It's kind of a, a very stable prediction. And if it was in the competition, it would be resting right now 15th out of 11 plus million brackets which isn't number one, but it's not bad. So as a result of this, uh, if we looked a little more closely, in the Elite Eight, there were quite a few upsets that really made this year more challenging. In particular, four of the eight teams in the Elite Eight were major upsets, and three of the four in the Final Four, which reached them, were also major upsets. And this creates havoc with these models because they're trying to predict the future. I suspect this year we will not be able to top the winner of the tournament. But we're going to tweak and do more analysis and see ways that we can modify our results. So to give you a kind of a quick overview of what we've done is we've presented a model based purely on seeds that enable people to put together a bracket. And as a result of that, if we go through and do the analysis, we see in fact that the results are supported by traditional validation methods, 
We've done that. Now, a lot of our research relies on the fact that the selection committee is intelligent, that they are continuing to use the same criteria when they set their seatings. If they don't, then how could we assume that what happened in 1997 in terms of the probability of a particular seed beating another seed is going to be true in 2013 or 2014 or in the future? We have to make that assumption. One of the other difficulties is that the game does keep changing, and this does affect the analysis, but it's very hard to capture that in the short run. The introduction of the 35 second clock, of course, made a big difference because it enabled teams before who were slower and shorter to hold the ball and basically milk the clock so that they can hopefully win. We saw that when Villanova beat Georgetown a few decades ago. The expansion of the three-point arc, they kind of changed the distance and the further they push it out, the harder it is for teams to take advantage of that. In essence, weaker teams upsetting stronger teams. And occasionally they do change the criteria. I haven't seen a lot of that, but there may be hidden under the covers some of this stuff. So we've tried to show that seeds really may be enough to put together reasonable brackets. Now, what we're trying to do is, in fact, we have a Markov chain model which does something very similar. And we can also generate brackets using that. I haven't talked about that here. But it does produce very comparable and, in some cases, better results. And the other thing is that the nice thing about this Markov chain model is it enables you to estimate things like the probability of number 16 winning a game in the first round, which, of course, the exponential model cannot do because the data does not support that. Now, what have we done? Around five years ago, I said, we need to make this available to people to have some fun. And at that time, we had a different model than I presented here. We had a geometric model. Similar in spirit to the exponential, but a little different. So I uh, recruited a couple of undergraduates who are basketball junkies, and I said, guys, let's take this model and let's make it into a website so that people could use it. So we designed what we call the website Bracket Odds. And this is the address. It's bracketodds.cs.illinois.edu. And what it basically does is enable you to look at the last four rounds, the Elite Eight, the Final Four, the National Finals, and the National Championship game. And you can compute the odds or the probability of any seed combinations, as well as compare seed combinations. So for example, if you take the current Final Four seed combination, 1, 2, 7, and 8, and compare it to 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 2, 3 is in the order of around 75 to 80 times more likely than what we have this year which shows you how rare it actually is. And you can also even compute conditional probabilities of seed combinations in the last two rounds. You can do it in also the other rounds, but it was just a little more complex. And we didn't think that the average sports fan was going to appreciate uh, conditional probabilities. So we decided not to put it in. Now, the models can do much more than the website functionality. But, and, I have, and I get questions. Like this year, people send me a question saying, what's the probability of having 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 number twos in the final four? And I just go to my model, and I have it set up, and I pre-computed it and send it to them, just like I can do it for once. Someone also sent me an email saying, I will team with you, and we'll, we'll participate in competitions, and we'll split the winnings. <laughs> Needless to say, I did not respond to that email. Uh, some tips with your bracket, as I said, is build your brackets before Selection Sunday. I know this sounds crazy, but it will produce results that will not be any worse than what you would produce <laughs> if you were going to do it with knowing the teams. Great. Knowing the teams, in some sense, could be a detriment because we have hidden biases. Let the numbers determine what you're going to put together in your bracket. The other mistake that people make is they either put too many or too few upsets. You can put too few upsets. We saw that by using kind of the best pick. It doesn't produce very good results. The number one seed does win most frequently, but you, the most likely number one seeds in the final four are one or two. And there's a whole bunch of other such tips that I have on the website. So what's the take home message from this? Bracket indexing wins in the long run. So if you want to create with, a, with your city a, a million brackets, 100,000 brackets, 10,000 brackets, 1,000 brackets, and put them against our randomly generated brackets, I think we can do quite well with you. Because we're using the concept of indexing based on historical information, based purely on the seeds and the data. 
What I tell people is pick your seeds, not your teens, because the seeds contain enough information to put together a good bracket, and data analytics does rule, because without it, we couldn't do this, and we couldn't produce results. So you may not like the approach that we're proposing, but you can't deny the results. If we were producing results that were not very favorable, then you'd say, oh, this isn't anything. But the data contains the information, and what we've tried to do is obtain that. So I want to thank you very much. Visit our website, bracketodds.cs.illinois.edu. We update it for every year. In fact, I'm just doing some of the number crunching as each round progresses, and I'll be ready to have it uploaded by the next basketball season. And remember to put your brackets together before Selection Sunday, not afterwards. You want to take a question? Sure. Thank you.